because I come from the maintenance side of the house, I foresee maintenance shortage. Welcome to the Aviation Insurance Podcast, the podcast that helps aircraft owners and aviation businesses learn and understand the complex world of aviation insurance and risk management. From the basic principles of aviation insurance to risk management techniques and updates on the aviation insurance market, the Aviation Insurance Podcast is your guide to traverse the world of aviation insurance. Now, here's your host, Tim Bonnell. Well, welcome to the Aviation Insurance Podcast. It's fall, it's, uh, the leaves are turning in many parts of the United States, and a lot of people are getting ready to head back to Las Vegas for the National Business Aviation Association Convention. And so today we want to talk about business aviation. And so I wanted to bring on as a guest Eli Stepp of Biz Av Jets. And uh, he has got a well-rounded and uh, diverse background and history and activity in the business aviation industry. And so I'm excited to uh, have a discussion with him today and, and to mutually learn with uh, our audience uh, all the interesting things he does. So with that, uh, Eli, welcome to the podcast. Tim, thank you for being here. I greatly appreciate the opportunity and look forward to our discussion. Absolutely. So given all this information and the diversity I talked about, tell us about your journey you know, to become the owner, the founder of the Biz, Av- Biz Avjets and, and all the different activities it and any related companies do. Sure, sure. Be happy to share that. Uh, yeah, you know, I started my aviation journey back in 1981 when I uh, re- was released from the Army as a turbine engine mechanic. And fortunately, that gave me a career. And I've been on the maintenance and operations side uh, my whole career, uh, actually turning wrenches sometimes, but I was also a field service rep. Uh, for Camp Systems and also a sales rep for West Star Aviation, just a few. But when it came to, to Biz Abjets, um, the reason I started that, and it was, I wouldn't say it was a fluke, but you know, I just started branding Biz Abjets on LinkedIn. And the reason I started, I was so tired of business aviation being slammed in the press. And I wanted to share positive information about business aviation. And some of the things, you know, like 15,000 flights a year for, for humanitarian purposes. And it goes unsaid on how much help when a hurricane happens, business airplanes swoop in, help out, bring in supplies, and they don't ask for any credit. So nobody really hears about it. They don't want to brag. You know, so I wanted some of those others things shared. And then a friend of mine uh, said, hey, why don't you become an official company, you know, and he, he applied a little seed money at, at so it became a, an official S corporation, basically doing the same thing, promoting business aviation. But that kind of rolled into a group that wanted to try a private flight. Uh, so we set up a charter from uh, Las Vegas to Los Angeles and back the same day. So we would get both legs of the flight. And, uh, you know, they enjoyed it very much. In fact, we've got a couple more of those. It's not my main moneymaker or anything like that, but that's kind of the fun part. But after that, uh, In Flight USA magazine contacted me and wanted to do an article uh, on the company. And I had an idea about three years before that and said, I would love to do a business aviation magazine. Are you open to that? So we formed a partnership. So I have a separate entity. I'm co or co publisher, BizApp Jets USA magazine. So, you know, basically, also I offer advisory services. It's kind of a niche business, uh, you know, from my experience. and. It may be something as small as just some guidance on the phone or my opinion, or it could be I go to the facility and and help watch the airplane. Uh, You know, so that's kind of what Biz Abjets does compared to Biz Abjets USA Magazine. So I hope that's a good explanation of of how I got started. Yeah. So, yeah, I think that it shows, you know, you've had some areas in advisory, marketing, um, publishing, and and obviously creating a, a good name for business aviation and the way that it is rather than some of the narratives that get told in the press from time to time that aren't as positive. Oh, and I'm glad I thank you for uh, mentioning the marketing portion, which we all should do. Yeah, sure. So what trend overall are you most excited about with business aviation today? Well, you know, I, from my exposure, from my niche business, I'm really excited about people being introduced to business aviation. 
you know, groups that may take a flight like the one I told you about, they're excited to try it. And I've seen several instances of people being introduced to business aviation that thought they would never do it. And now you have groups, to, you know, taking flights. I know of a hunting group out of Maine every year. They they take their all of the group and their dogs, you know. And, you know, so I'm excited about the new individuals that are coming to business aviation. On the other flip side of the coin, what are your biggest concerns about the industry in the near or longer term future? Well, I'm somewhat concerned about um, the negativity uh, of um, the climate issue. And it's my understanding, you know, 2% of carbon emissions aviation causes, 2% of all of it. And it's my understanding business aviation, it's 0.2%. But my concern is like we've seen in Europe of throwing paint on airplanes, activists, and there are many other industries that are polluting way more than aviation and business aviation. So that's my concern is really changing the mindset and uh, sharing information that proves business aviation is not the toxic waste dump that some are making it out to be. So what can we do as an industry to try to continue to you know, combat, you know, those challenges and, and to change that narrative. Yeah, agreed. You know, what specific steps could be taken to do that? Like, uh, you know, is there specific messages that need to be spread or what, what other actions can, you know, different members of the, you know, di- you know, different sectors of the business aviation industry do to help combat these challenges? You, you know, I just interviewed um, Greg Woods of Cirrus Aviation Services, not Cirrus Aircraft, but Cirrus Aviation Charter Company, mm-hmm. and they'll be on the cover of our next issue. But uh, since 2015, and I didn't know this, they've been carbon neutral. So I think many of the flight departments or charter organizations that don't mind being public, obviously charter operations don't mind being public to gain the business, I really think they should put out and hammer on social media Every other day, maybe that's too much, but cons- consecutively during the year of how they are carbon neutral, of how they are, you know, working to be carbon neutral. And uh, I I wish more uh, departments would do that, especially with social media is so available today. Yeah. And, you know, obviously there's the ongoing um, research into, you know, the aviation fuels of the next generation that will help address some of these items. And I don't know if that's getting a lot of press either. Have you, from your perspective and, and your publications, have you seen more of that information or is that some something that should be explored further? Actually, with Greg Woods also, we talked about their uh, sustainable fuel efforts. And yeah. right now, you know, sustainable fuel is not available everywhere. So, right. so there's an exchange program where you, you buy so many um, credits of the fuel and so it's kind of spread on different airplanes right now, but it has the same effect. So until sustainable fuel is everywhere, that's the way it's handled. But they're also doing that. And, uh, you know, when they're then being carbon neutral is, means they uh, apply money to an organization that helps plant trees and all the things that need to be done to carbon to be carbon neutral. Yeah, obviously, the, the SAF is the shortened version for sustainable aviation fuel and that along with the climate issues, it's it's a concern for all you know um, sectors of the market, particularly in the visibility uh, and the narrative that comes out the, the as you talked about. And so even even in the aviation in- insurance industry, it's a topic that they're paying attention to, and, and certainly promoting anything that would have a positive impact on you know safe and you know operations of the aircraft and more sustainable ongoing and future efforts, but obviously evaluating risk in the process. So they're, obviously their concern is more related to, uh, you know, risk of loss and the, the sustainability of the industry. But, uh, you know, I think, you know, it takes each party, you know, the manufacturers, the service providers, uh, you know, even the insurance industry, all, you know, working together to build that positive narrative of, uh, of the proactive nature of the business aviation industry at, at all levels. And, um, and then to also minimize the current, um, 
you know, negative uh, narrative that keeps getting shared to the media, you know, in varying waves at different times. So it, it, it's, I guess, would say it kind of it, it it's a it's an industry wide uh, issue and it's something that needs positive communication. Though. Would you agree? I, I agree, and you know, I, I'll continue with individuals in aviation, business aviation, with social media, which is so available, can go to noplanenogain.org, and there are plenty of studies, there are plenty of graphics you can post, and really, I think every, every aviation person, if they're using social media, should post something once a week or once a month about that, uh, because it's going to take all of us in the industry to change the mindset. If you had a, a metaphorical crystal ball, what would you say is coming you know, on the horizon uh, for business aviation? When you look at and survey in your publication and talk to people, what are some of the things you see are coming uh, in the future to business aviation that aren't here today? Uh, well, being all, uh, first of all, because I come from the maintenance side of the house, I foresee maintenance shortage. Uh, now, I don't think it is as bad as it's been projected in the last year. However, there is a mindset out there that, um, and I'm all for education, don't get me wrong, but, and, but uh, college and, you know, being white collar. But, you know, we can also have college individuals who can turn wrenches. And, you know, it's very common out to at least have an associate's degree along with it, if not a bachelor's. Um, you know, but I'm a little bit concerned about a shortage about that. So that's what I see there. On on the upside, I see the new technologies with the aircraft and the you know, uh, systems, uh, you know, uh, flight systems and everything that's making it more relevant and um, more safe and a bit easier to fly. Don't get me wrong. Pilots need to know dead reckoning and all the information that they need to know to handle an airplane in case of failures, but the systems are so good now that I'm just excited about the aircraft that are coming out and the availability to fly them. So what are some of the other big topics that are making their way to the issues of your publications about the business aviation industry today? Uh, well, some of the topics, uh, and we had another um, interview with Chris Broyhill, who was a PhD that has recently, and I'll drop his business uh, comp air, I think it was comp air out calculator and uh, salaries. You know, so that's been discussed as well. And as we know, the airlines have really went hard at pilots and maintenance personnel and business aviation, you know, <laughs> could lose personnel. So some of the flight departments, uh, according to, to Chris's uh, input, are, are coming along great. But some don't think there needs to be any raise or anything. And unfortunately, some of them have lost personnel because of it, because the airlines really need people and uh, business aviation can lose them. And, you know, business aviation has been so good to me. And, and I, I love the airlines, don't get me wrong, but I, I hate to lose our people. <laughs> so... So that was some of the other issues is loss of people that we've talked about. At Aris Insurance Solutions, our customers tell us that they work with us because we are responsive. We get back to them quickly. We're reliable to get the job done and follow through with what they've asked us to do. We communicate effectively so they always know what we're doing, we anticipate their needs so that they don't have to think of everything they need in their aviation insurance program. And this and many more reasons are why people work with Aris Insurance Solutions. To learn how you can contact and work with Aris Insurance Solutions, click in the link below for all that information. Yeah, I think that's really where the bridge with the insurance comes along is the need, you know, the desire to have, uh, you know, highly trained uh, personnel that operate with, you know, strong safety mindset with quality assurance concerns. And, and so to make sure that there's that pipeline of people on the business aviation side, as we get into, you know, and, and the, the pilot maintenance shortages, they kind of come and go, uh, depending on different waves of, of the economy and, and, and world events. But definitely it's a concern today. And I think that's, um, you know, definitely an issue that uh, affects the insurance industry and the concerns from a risk management perspective is just having that pipeline of well-educated um, 
you know, mechanics and pilots uh, that well trained and and uh, have that safety mentality. So I could definitely see how that's kind of be an ongoing concern for for everyone in the industry. What 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 are some of the things that some successful operations have done? Do you think to retain that kind of talent that's already there? Well, uh, it always comes down to the human interface. And on the business aviation end, um, when you replace a person, you know, it needs to be the right person, you know, because uh, flight departments are like a family, business aviation flight departments. And, you know, there are certain mindsets that uh, work and sometimes, sometimes they don't. Uh, like NFL football, maybe a quarterback's great on one team, but not so great on the other. Sometimes the human interface don't work or don't work as well as what you had. So it's another real reason not to lose a well-working flight department person when it's working like a well-oiled machine. So that's, the, again, the human interface is, is a really big factor. So how much of it is a pay issue versus just the culture of the organization there? And do you think? Well, that's, that's a great question. Um, I would say <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to throw figures out there that I can't prove, but I'm going to say probably at least 60% of the pay and 40% is liking your, and uh, and being effective and working with the team. So the management sees that as well. Not just a person liking the job, but the management team saying, this is really a good fit. Let's do what we can. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, with any organization, people will often uh, stay at a, at a role, even if it, you know, comes at maybe a slightly smaller salary, if they really enjoy the people they're working with or the people they're working for and the culture of the organization. And I think that's a, uh, to your point, just something really important to remind ourselves as an industry, whether, whether you're on the marketing or consulting side, whether you're on the manufacturing service, uh, you know, charter, management, any of those sides is that it's really important to not only have good and safe operations, but it's to have, you know, good leadership and, you know, a positive culture within your organization, positive in terms of working environment, in addition to safety, uh, quality management and those different areas. And so uh, I definitely, I think I would agree with your trends and, uh, you know, and the, uh, if the culture piece is higher, it may be less of a salary issue and the culture piece is uh not so good that it's more of a salary. I think, you know, just, just in listening to your answer, that really what, what comes to my mind. Well, I'll, I'll tell you, uh, and, you know, age is a factor. When, when a person is younger, of course, we're trying to make a mark. We're trying to buy a house. We're trying to sell finances are really important. But then what will happen is you may, and it's happened in my career, where I thought this was a dream job. It's well paid. And it turned out not to be so great. So when you get to a person that's, 35, you know, they probably learned a couple of lessons by then. And they're willing to ask questions like, how do your personnel get along? Why did the last person leave? You know, things of that nature. And and if they get into uh, a flight department, that's a great culture. They're less likely to leave because they've learned that lesson already. And say, so, yeah, you know, I've done that, but I'm okay with what I'm doing here. Yeah, the, the grass is often greener on the other side. And I think to your point, you get to that certain point where you're be able, better able to determine that maybe it's not. Sometimes it may be, and uh, often it really may not. So, yeah, these are all, you know, issues that affect, you know, any business, but certainly business aviation due to the highly specialized nature and given the other neighboring industries like the airlines. Uh, but let's turn to the uh, upcoming convention in your hometown area. Uh, in Las Vegas, uh, we're we're still a few weeks out as we're recording this. Uh, but are, is there anything uh, that's coming up uh, in Las Vegas or related to the convention that you're excited about, or that people should be thinking about? I'm excited about the show uh, yeah. in general, and I'm very blessed to be able to go as uh, I, the press. You know, so we register, and I bring a photographer with me. And, you know, so I'm very excited about that and seeing the people when it comes to, to the things I like is seeing people I know, of course, and all those. But I'm excited to interview as much as I can on, on what's going on, the new, uh, new, you know, shows or facilities or, or whatever is happening. And um, 
I'm excited for the Corporate Angel Network. I think everyone should consider going to their uh, reception, you know, where they raise funds. And I've been to it a couple of times. It's very well worth going and uh, connecting with uh, people I know. Um, I can't say, I, I would like to say, uh, at one time I worked uh, for a company called Aircraft Blogs. They did IRS and, uh, you know, SEC reporting. So at that time, I was able to attend the tax conferences before the MBA. Um, I don't know if we'll cover that this year or not, but anybody in the industry with the flight department, send one representative to, to this because it is such a, for me anyway, a convoluted requirement. And you want to know information, even if it's just from a surface level, to say, oh, I need to be in contact with an accounting company that knows how to do this because you can save yourself a lot of heartache. When I worked for them, I learned quite a bit from just being a person that is not an accountant, that, you know, you got to worry about what the employee levels are, uh, how it applies to the IRS or the SEC, and it's really uh, interesting. It can be a little bit scary, too. So anyway, so somebody should be. So I'm excited for to answer your question you know, the tax uh, portion and uh, the uh, corporate angel network event. Yeah, and, and to your point about the, you know, the, the having the press credentials, there's just a lot of announcements that's always coming, you know, every year at, at NBA, you know, new aircraft, major innovations. It's always an exciting time to see, you know, what may be coming down the pike in, in business aviation. And obviously there's so much information that you're able to fill a lot of uh, um, publications with the, uh, Considerable stories. Well, just, and some, of, some of the press releases are just coming out now. Yeah. You know, that, that we could get take a look at and, you know, make plans on who we're going to visit. That was something I just learned this year with our mutual friend uh, Paula at ABC High is that a lot of the press releases are, need to be in a month out because we actually have uh, something we'll be announcing. And uh, so we're, we're working to finalize the details on that. So by the time this comes out, uh, maybe that whole information will be out there. But, uh, that was a that's a good piece of information though because I don't think everyone knows that you know with it so you have a major announcement it's a lot of these things are compiled a month in advance uh, and then held into the show and so uh, that that's a really good uh, tidbit to share. Well, just looking at the time, I want to respect your time. Is there uh, any questions I should have asked you, but then, or just any closing thoughts you'd have? Uh, no, you know, I, from a curiosity standpoint, uh, and I appreciate the opportunity to be here. You know, from the insurance end of it, which you're in, I mean, if I can ask you a question, what is your major focus? Is it uh, insurance on the aircraft, insurance on the personnel, on the flight department? Uh, you know, what is uh, your focus or your company's focus in that? Regard? Yeah, well, we're yeah we're an aviation insurance brokerage, and so we work for you know aviation businesses, airports, and and obviously uh, aircraft owners, and so we're. You know, we're looking to help them find, um, A, we're working to collect the right risk information, the right safety and training information, and present it correctly to the right insurance companies, um, you know, would be the best fit for them and provide the best coverage for the best, you know, best terms. And so it's an, it's really an ongoing uh, concern being involved with an insured, you know, not just from obtaining terms, but walking alongside of them as part of the risk management team. Uh, from certificates of insurance they need issued or received, reviewing uh, aviation contracts for insurance concerns. Uh, you know, we really, um, you know, with many of our clients, which a lot of ours are, are privately owned, professionally led, uh, aviation businesses, airports, and and um, and aircraft. And, uh, you know, we're very much an integral part of their ongoing team and um, one of those advisors in their hats. And so for, for Aris Insurance Solutions, you know, we're a brokerage. Our, our insurance carriers, um, you know, work with, with brokers like us. Um, some of them have been around since you know, the late 20s, and some of them have been around since last year. And we have about approximately 20 that do various aviation coverages for aircraft or aviation liabilities. And then there's some that, that do like airport property and aviation workers' compensation. And so it takes, you know, every, every insurance company has a different risk appetite. So that's why it takes an industry of multiple insurance companies. Oftentimes, you know, some larger risks need multiple insurance companies just to spread the risk on a single policy. Uh, and so uh, that's why we have, a, you know, a vast industry and, and multiple resources 
Uh, and that's why it kind of requires an aviation insurance broker to bring those different pieces together, you know, for an individual airport, aviation business, or aircraft on it. Well, that's educational for me. I appreciate that explanation. It helps me understand it a little bit better. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot involved. I mean, you know, the aviation insurance industry is, is a big industry with in, inside of the aviation industry with specialists, many of which are pilots or, um, you know, are highly trained for that, you know, Insuring aircraft and aviation operations considerably different than um, than insuring you know home and auto and and non aviation businesses due to uh, the things that aircraft do that other vehicles can't do and due to the the value of these aircraft and and operations and and quite frankly due to the liability awards that get awarded against aviation operations compared to non aviation operations and that's kind of the concern of our insurers, as we do these interviews, and as obviously day to day, I talk to them, you know, there's a growing concern uh, each day, each year about the increasing uh, liability awards that are handed out, aviation risks and the frequency of those awards. So that's something that uh, if you want to get into the concerns of the aviation insurance industry, uh, you know, that's one of the largest. But uh, there is just like you talked about, there's excited about the emerging technologies from a safety perspective. Uh uh, from a technology perspective, and then just from an industry, you know, we've got new things going on, uh, like the advanced air mobility, advanced, uh, you know, EV tall, electronic vertical takeoff and landing segments, uh, just a lot of innovations happening in the market uh, of aviation in general. And then uh, for aviation insurance operations, we want to obviously brokers or agencies and the insurance companies want to be um, innovating right alongside of our our industry to help address their risks and find solutions coverages they require that's that's the short version yeah that was good. no it was very informational thanks well i'm sure we could probably talk for an hour but uh when i just uh, thank you for your time there's uh, an exciting national business aviation association event coming up here very soon and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you there in person and uh we know you you're uh uh, your publication will be putting out some uh, products and some news stories. So where can our listeners go to find uh, that information and, and some of those news stories? Well, listen, I, I appreciate being here. i uh, grateful for the opportunity, you know, and if uh, viewers want to, they can go to bizavjets.com for the advisory, you know, promotional side, the bizavjetsusa.com, and they can see links to our magazines online. We also have them in print. So thank you very much. That's great. Will they be a, will we have anything available at the NBAA publications section? Thanks yeah. for that question. Yes. We'll have hard copies of our, our next issue at, at the show. Yeah. So I've, I've, I've uh, reviewed them a number of times and always enjoy what you put out. So thank you what you do for the uh, business aviation industry. And we'll look forward to seeing you in Las Vegas. And uh, I just thought with, uh, with, with the convention coming up, it'd be great to just, uh, have a conversation about business aviation. So Eli, thank you for doing that for us today, for joining us and for being a fantastic guest. All right. Thanks so much, Tim. I appreciate it. Well, that's all for this episode. Join us again next time as we continue navigating the waypoints in aviation insurance and the aviation industry in general. general. So until then, enjoy clear skies and unlimited visibility. Thanks for listening to the Aviation Insurance Podcast. If you found this episode of value, please share it with someone who would benefit from this information. Don't forget to subscribe in your podcast player so you don't miss any new episodes and to help our show have more impact. This episode is brought to you by Eris Insurance Solutions, your flight plan for navigating the turbulence of aviation insurance. For more information, visit erisinsurance.com. That is www.aerisinsurance.com. Disclaimer, these episodes are for educational purposes only, and due to the changing regulatory and legal nature of the business, some information may change over time. Having a well-educated and experienced aviation insurance broker on your team is an absolute requirement to success in business and for managing your aircraft and aviation business risks.